Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 15. This will be the first part of the modes of operations of block ciphers and the roadmap for this lecture is as follows. We will see how to get efficient CPA secure ciphers via two modes of operations namely the ECB mode and the CBC mode. The remaining modes of operations we will see in the next module. So, just to recall in the last lecture we had seen a candidate CPA secure encryption process for encrypting big L bit messages right and the two drawbacks that we have identified in that uh, in that in this encryption process is that the cipher text size is large compared to the plain text specifically if big L and uh, little l are same then the cipher text is twice the size of the plain text. And the second disadvantage here is that each encryption of the encryption process requires a fresh randomness of little l bits. So, that leads us to what we call as modes of operations of block cipher and basically the goal here is the following. Imagine you are given a keyed function which could be either a pseudo random function or a pseudo random permutation or a strong pseudo random permutation and the construction that you are given with is a length preserving uh, function namely the block size x and uh, output size are the same namely big L. And for simplicity we assume that the big L is n, but it could be any polynomial function of your security parameter. So, you are given the description of such a function f and the goal here is the following. We have now a large message consisting of several blocks of uh, big L, big L uh, bits namely imagine you have little l number of blocks and our goal is to come up with an encryption process where I can encrypt such large messages such that the resultant encryption process should be CPA secure and the resultant encryption process should have a randomness usage as minimum as possible. The cipher text expansion should be as minimum as possible and there should be a support for parallelism that means if there is a scope where I can encrypt multiple blocks in parallel given that I have multiple computing processes available with me then my uh, encryption process should provide that support. And most importantly the overall security of my encryption process should depend upon the minimal security assumption for from the function f that means it should suffice if my function f is just a pseudo random function that is our overall so, let us see one of the ways of doing that and then we will analyze which of which of these following properties that I have listed here are achieved and what are not achieved. So, this mode is called as the electronic code book or ECB in short and to demonstrate that imagine I have a message consisting of three blocks of big L bits. So, the way I am going to encrypt in the ECP mode here is as follows. So, since I have three in blocks of big L bits each of them is going to be encrypted using the same k. So, I feed the same k to three invocations of my underlying function f. So, that is the key and the block input for the in underlying invocations of the function f are actually the blocks of the message. That means, m 1 goes as it is as the block for the first invocation. Similarly, for the second invocation m 2 goes as it is as the block input and in the third invocation m 3 serves as the block input. And the resultant output C1, C2, C3 is basically what is my cipher text. That means the cipher text will be the concatenation of C1, C2, and C3. So, in general, the encryption process here is the evaluation of the keyed function fk on the block input mi, and the decryption process here is basically the inversion of the keyed function fk under the same key k on the ith cipher text ci to recover back the ith plain text block. That means, you can see that in this case my function f should be a keyed pseudo random permutation. It should not be a many to one function otherwise the uh, decryption will become ambiguous. Also the imp another interesting property here is that my cipher text size is exactly the same as the message size. So, if I have three blocks of l bits l bits l bits then I have a cipher text consisting of three blocks of l bits l bits l bits each. Moreover, this encryption process or encryption mode supports parallelism. That means, if I have three computing processors available with me, then C1 can be computed independently of C2, which can be computed independently of C3. That means, at the same time in parallel, I can compute C1, C2, C3. Same holds for the encryption and for the decryption. Now, let us answer the most important part whether this ECB mode is CPU secure or not, and the answer is 
Absolutely no, because as you can see here that this ECB mode is a deterministic encryption scheme. That means, wherever the message blocks are getting repeated I and if I encrypt those repeated message block under the same key k, I am going to see the same ciphertext block, which is fundamentally against the principle that in order to achieve CPA security, my encryption process should be randomized. So, since this encryption process is deterministic, no way I can claim that this encryption process is CPA secure. To give you a feeling of how insecure this ECB mode can be, let us see a practical example. So, suppose I want to encrypt an image using ECB mode and since an image is basically a collection of pixels, what I can do is that I can imagine a group of pixels in my image as one X block and feed it as the message block during the invocation of ECB mode. So, here is a black and white image basically which I want to encrypt and if I encrypt it using the ECB mode, the encrypted image will look like the following right and as you can see from the encrypted image you have an absolutely clear pattern which is available in the encrypted image and the reason it is happening is wherever you have a group of black pixels, it will always produce the same kind of ciphertext and wherever you have a group of white pixels that will always produce the same kind of ciphertext and that pattern will be clearly visible in the encrypted image. And if I send this kind of encrypted image over the insecure channel intercepted by an adversary, the adversary can easily find out what exactly is the underlying image. Ideally, if I want to encrypt this black and white image using some so called secure mode, it should produce this kind of encrypted image where there is absolutely no pattern available in the encrypted image irrespective of whether it is a white pixel that I am encrypting or whether it is a black pixel I am encrypting. We will later see how exactly those secure modes look like, but for the time being if I just focus on ECB mode, it is completely useless. The lesson that we learned from this example is that a block cipher namely the function f should not be used directly to encrypt a message and if you see the syntax of ECB mode, what we were actually doing, we were doing that mistake, we were directly encrypt a message using the invocations of f where the same key was getting used in all the invocations. So, we should not do that and if you recall our candidate CPA secure scheme, we never encrypted the message directly by feeding it to the function f. We actually fed a random x input to the function f, generated the pad which was XORed with the message to produce the actual ciphertext, right. So, that is the ECB mode and clearly it is no, it is not CPA secure. Now, let us go to the second mode which we also called as, which we also call as ciphertext block chaining or CBC mode. And this mode was used in some older versions of the real world TLS protocol. Again for demonstration assume you have three blocks each consisting of uh, L bytes, big L bytes. So, the way we encrypt here is as follows. We first choose a random IV which we denote as C0 and which is going to be a part of the ciphertext and the length of this C0 will be the same as the block size input of my underlying function f that means big L bits. And now I am going to encrypt the three individual blocks by invoking three invocations of my function f with the same key k. The first invocation of the function f is basically on the XOR of the message m1 with the iv serving as the block. I obtain the output c1 and the reason this mode is called as the ciphertext block chaining is that we are now going to do a kind of chaining process. The ciphertext block C1 which I have obtained now, it is going to be chained and XORed with the second block of my message and the resultant XOR serves as the block input for my second invocation of my function f and gives me the output C2. And now this serves as the chain for the next block of the message, XORed with the third block, fed as a block for the third invocations of my function f and I stop with the ciphertext block C3. And my overall ciphertext will be C0 concatenated with C1, C2, C2, C2 and C3. So, in general, if I want to uh, do the encryption of the ith block, the ith block is basically the evaluation of the keyed function fk, where the block input is the XOR of the current message block and the previous ciphertext block. And that is why the name ciphertext block chaining. And the random IV that we are selecting here at the beginning of the encryption has to be a part of the ciphertext. If I want to decrypt the ith ciphertext block, the way I do that is I compute the inverse of the keyed function fk with, with respect to the same key 
and if so for instance if I want to decrypt say C3 I perform the inversion invert I compute the invert of f uh, of C3 with respect to the function fk and if I invert I basically obtain the XOR of M3 and C2 and to cancel out the effect of C2 I just have to take the XOR of C2 with this recovered thing. So, that is what the generic uh, I decryption of the ith block right. That means, my function f should be a keyed permutation if I want to unambiguously do the decryption part here. Now, what is the overall ciphertext size here? Well, the number of blocks in the ciphertext is exactly the same as the number of blocks in the message plus an additional block for the IV part. That means, in terms of message expansion that is the minimal you can think of. This is significantly better compared to the candidate uh, PRF, uh, PRF based CPA secure scheme which we had done in which we had seen in the last lecture. However, one of the drawbacks of this mode is that it is a it does not support parallelism. So, that means, the encryption of the second block can happen only when the encryption of the first block has happened because I need that for the chaining purpose and so on right. More importantly this instance this uh, encryption process is a randomized encryption process because every time I have a new message the IV will be picked randomly and which basically triggers the randomness in the entire chaining process. In fact, we can formally prove that if the underlying function f is a secure PRP as per the indistinguishability definition then this mode of operation is indeed CPA secure. And you can see any of the references namely the book by Kart Slindel or the book by Bonnet et al for the actual proof. I am not going to give you the actual proof here. Right. Now, let us see uh, uh, an in interesting aspect of the CBC mode. So, the way I had discussed CBC mode till now is that I assume that uh, the number of blocks in the message is basically uh, it is a multiple of the block length of your underlying f. Right. So, imagine that the block length of the underlying function f is big L bytes. Right. So, there could be two cases with respect to the underlying message which I want to encrypt. If the number of bytes in my underlying message which I want to encrypt is already a multiple of big L bytes, then I can just divide my message into several chunks of big L byte, big L bytes and do the CBC mode of encryption as I discussed. But what if my underlying message is not a multiple of big L bytes, right? The length of the message is not a multiple of big L bytes. That means, I have to now do some kind of padding before I actually encrypt my message because if I do not do the padding I cannot apply the CBC mode of encryption because even if I divide my message into blocks of big L bytes the last block will not be a length of big L bytes and hence I cannot apply an instance of my underlying function f. So, what I am going to do here is I am going to discuss what kind of padding we have to use and convert to apply to my underlying message before doing the CBC mode of encryption. So, my padding mechanism has to be invertible and it has to be unambiguous right. So, let us let me discuss one of the important uh, interesting padding mechanism which we call as PKCS version 5 padding and the idea here is let, let little b denote the number of bytes which I need to add in the last block in my message m. So, that the overall padded message uh, it, uh, its length become a multiple of big L bytes right. So, once I have identified the value of little b what I basically do is I append little b number of bytes in the last block and each of them represents the integer value b. Once I do this my padded message will now consist uh, its length will be a multiple of big L bytes which I can divide into several blocks of big L bytes and now I can do my usual CBC mode of encryption. How I am going to do the decryption? Well, at the decryption end the receiver will pick up the try to decrypt the last ciphertext block as per the usual CBC mode right. And then what it is going to do is that once it recover the padded last block namely m2 dash in this example it is going to read the last byte value and from that last byte value it is going to learn the value of b. And it will see whether the last recovered b bytes indeed represent all the integer it indeed represents the byte value b. If that is the case just strip off those last b bytes and the remaining thing will be the actual message which was encrypted and communicated by the sender. 
On the other hand, if the last b bytes do not represent the integer value b, that means some error has occurred while sending the encrypted message and hence the receiver is going to output back padding. Now, based on the encryption process and decryption process, you might be wondering that what should be the range of b, that means how many bytes I should, uh, that how many bytes need to be appended so that my padded message its length become a multiple of big L bytes and intuition says that the b, b, uh, range of little b should range from 0 to L minus 1. 0 because I made I might have a message whose length is already a multiple of big L bytes and L minus 1 because I might have a message where actually I need to append L minus 1 bytes. But it turns out that the range of B cannot be from 0 to L minus 1 because that is not going to lead to invertible padding because that might lead to ambiguity whether padding has occurred or padding has not occurred. The problematic case is B is equal to 0, right. A receiver cannot distinguish whether uh, padding has append or not happened when he is decrypting here. So, that is why when b is equal to 0 actually we make b equal to l. That means, if at the sender's end no padding is required then to indicate it in an un unambiguous fashion to the receiver sender is going to add a full block of big L bytes each of them representing the integer value big L that is an indication to the receiver that actually no padding has occurred and the entire last block has to be stripped off. So, the range of b is not 0 to l minus 1, but say actually 1 to l right. So, that is a way we can actually do an encryption of arbitrary long messages using CBC mode of encryption by doing this padding. Now, let me also discuss very interesting aspect of the CBC mode what we call a stateful variant of the CBC mode. And if you see the way CBC mode is defined, if you have two different messages say m and m dash in sequence one after the other of course, of different lengths say for example, message m consists of three blocks followed by another message m dash consisting of two blocks, then this is the ideal way sender should have encrypted m and m dash. For encrypting m sender should have picked some independent i v denoted as i v 1 and should have done the chaining part. And then if there is another message follow up message m dash sender should ideally pick another independent IV say IV2 and should have done the CBC mode of encryption. But a smart implementer might imagine that if sender and receivers are synchronized and if the same sender and the same receiver are going to do a sequence of several encrypted communication then why do not we maintain state. And what do I maintain mean by maintaining state here is that why cannot we you retain the last cipher text block of the last of the last message between the sender and the receiver and use it as the IV for the next message which sender is going to encrypt and communicate to the receiver right. So, that is what I mean by maintaining the state here and actually if we do this there is an advantage of there is an advantage we get here. First of all for the next message namely m dash which sender wants to communicate. Uh, IV need not have to be picked. Both sender and receiver will know that since they are using a stateful variant C3 is going to serve as the IV right. So, that is some that saves the randomness uh, part and it also provides advantage in terms of bandwidth because now C3 need not be communicated again when M dash is encrypted. It will be known anyhow to the receiver that the decryption need to happen with respect to C3. So, big L bytes need not be communicated because the size of C3 would have been big L bytes. So, in that way we are actually saving bandwidth. And now you might be wondering whether this stateful variant is indeed CPA secure or not and intuitively you might feel that this stateful variant should be CPA secure because if actually sender would have got a larger message big M which is a concatenation of M and M dash then this is the way sender and receiver would have actually performed a CBC mode of encryption and decryption. C3 would have served as the IV and it, it would have been used for encrypting the message block M4 and so on right. That is intuition, but based on intuition we cannot formally say that whether a modified scheme is secure or not. And what we are going to now demonstrate is that the stateful variant is definitely not CBC, uh, it is not CPA secure, there is an attack here right. The attack basically stems from the fact that in the stateful variant adversary is already aware of the IV which is going to be used for the future message, which is not the case if the sender would have actually encrypted a long message, a single message consisting of both an M and M dash. In that case 
adversary would not be aware of the IV which is actually going to be used for M4, right. But in the case when M and M dash are treated as two different messages, uh, namely a sequence of messages, adversary is already aware of the IV which is going to be used for doing the chaining part for encrypting the message M dash. That means, in some sense it has the control over the randomness which the adversary can exploit and by asking encryption oracle queries and can completely identify whatever message block it wants to identify. So, let us see the attack scenario here. Imagine we have a sender and say sender the first message that it wants to encrypt is a concatenation of three blocks each of big L bytes. It does it using a stateful variant of CBC mode. So, since the message M is the first message which it is sending to the receiver, the IV will be picked randomly and C1, C2, C3 will be basically encryption of M1, M2, M3 and say there is an TPA attacker which intercepts this in encrypted packet, right. And now the adversary knows the relationship or the way C1, C2, C3 have been computed. The adversary does not know the K, it is unknown for the attacker, but the adversary knows the underlying mathematics which is used to compute C1, C2, C3. Now, imagine the CPA attacker uh, is under the following state, it somehow knows that the message M1 or the message M, the first block of the message M actually is either M10 or M11. That is a prior information somehow available with the adversary. Now, if the stateful variant of my CPA, CBC mode is indeed CPA secure, then even if the adversary has this prior knowledge and adversary sees this encrypted communication, by just seeing the ciphertext block C1, adversary should not be able to figure out whether it is an encryption of actually M10 or M11 without pro except with probability 1 by 2, even if my adversary gets access to the encryption oracle queries. But now, what we are going to demonstrate here is that if the sender and the receiver are using a stateful variant of CBC mode of encryption, how a smart CPA attacker can get encryption oracle query and identify whether the message block M1, uh, whether the whether it is M10 which is encrypted in C1 or whether it is M11 which is encrypted in C1, right. So, that is what we are going to demonstrate here. So, suppose the CPA attacker ask for an encryption oracle service for a new message M dash which is consisting of two blocks say M4 and M5 and M4 is selected in this specific way. The reason M4 is selected like this will be clear to you very soon. M5 could be any arbitrary block of big L bytes, I do not care about M5, but M4 is selected like this. And since we are in the CPA regime, we cannot prevent a CPA attacker from asking encryption oracle query for this kind of message. Now, in response suppose sender is not aware of the fact that it is interacting with an adversary and it is influenced to actually encrypt the message M dash consisting of these two blocks M4 and M5 with the same key K, but using a stateful variant of CBC mode of encryption. So, the encryption will now no longer consist of an IV because the IV for encrypting the message M dash will be the ciphertext block C3, right. So, adversary will know that the ciphertext block C4 is the value of the keyed function f on the XOR of M4 and M C3. And now, if I substitute the value of M4, the way M4 has been picked by the adversary, the effect of C3 and C3 cancels out. And basically, C4 turns out to be the value of the keyed function on the XOR of IV and M10. Now, Adversary has also seen the value of C1, right, because that was the encrypted communication which adversary has intercepted. And since my FK is a permutation, it is a keyed 1 to 1 onto mapping, adversary knows that C4 is going to be equal to C1 if and only if the message block M1 is same as M10. So, it has all the information available with it to find out whether the ciphertext block C1 was an encryption of M10 or whether it whether it is an encryption of M11 and with probability 1 our adversary is going to identify what exactly is the case. That is why we can no longer claim that the stateful variant of the CBC mode of encryption is CPA secure. 
and this attack was indeed launched in one of the earlier version of the TLS protocol where the implementers by mistake thought that the stateful variant of the CBC mode will be CPA secure and they ended up deploying that and this weakness was ex exploited by the attackers to launch what we call as a beast attack. And it is only later that this attack was formally identified and people realized that what exactly is the importance of formal proof. So, the lesson that we learned from this uh, example is that you should not make absolutely any modification to a crypto scheme which has been formally proved to be secure, right. Even if the modifications look benign to you until and unless you do not have a formal proof for the security of the modified scheme. So, that brings me to the end of this lecture. Just to summarize, we had seen two modes of operations of the uh, pseudo, -random, uh, pseudo random permutations namely the ECB mode and the CBC mode. Uh, the ECB mode is definitely not CPA secure and it is not recommended to use in practice and the CBC mode is CPA secure. We have not seen the proof though, but you have to believe me that it is CPA secure. The disadvantage of the CBC mode is that it is not stateful that means we cannot maintain the state across multiple messages and it does not support for parallelism. In the next lecture, we are going to see two other modes of uh, uh, pseudo random function and pseudo random permutations which are CPA secure and which actually get rid of the restrictions that are there or the drawbacks that are there with respect to the CBC mode. Thank you.